had a great weekend of club action this weekend, um, lads. But the two games I was probably looking forward to most was Mount Bellew, my luck against uh, Pierce's, Padre Pierce's, and Lockmore Castellani against Ballygunner. And both of those games were kind of, for me, they were ruined by ref- by referee. Weather didn't help either game. They weren't exactly classics or anything. But, like, I mean, we're going to go down through the, the different incidents, I suppose, in these games that we'd be a little bit disappointed in and start off with Noel McGrath. Um, Noel McGrath sending off, like, geez, he was playing well. And, you know, a lot more Castellani were up against it anyways, away from home against Ballygunner. And seemed to be a bit of an altercation between himself and Paddy Levy, um, just a young fella, off the off the ball a little bit and then Lockmore Castellani get a point and Noel McGrath we see this 101 times he wanted to stick the shoulder in him say go on now look where you know you're not so smart now kind of thing um, as it turns out instead of hitting him in the shoulder he got him kind of in the chest but like we're talking about a shoulder from maybe a foot away uh, Niall young Paddy Levy I don't want to be too critical of Paddy Levy because like I mean again he's only a young fella and he did get it in the chest so he's probably surprised about it a bit now he play acted a little bit too much like he did get hit uh, uh, without probably expecting it and you know he went down now like he was in an awful way when he wouldn't have been but uh, I mean are we, I don't know if I want to be too critical of him No I'd be the same as you Wooly I wouldn't be too critical of Paddy Levy because it, it, you know when you get a hit as well and you're not looking like he was looking the other way and Noel McGrath kind of came in and maybe blindsided him a small bit and like it, it's it's going to catch you by surprise then and you could see that by the way he went down but like the, as you said it is it's something that goes on um, the whole time it's just kind of settling in a score yeah and like Noel McGrath was clever like that he didn't use his hurl like that was that was his that was his defence that he didn't hit him with the hurl he gave yeah. him a he gave him a, a shoulder and in, like, in, it was a yellow card. In a way, in Paddy fairness. Levy's inexperience, like he should have been expecting that off Noel McGrath. They just had a, an altercation. Sometimes you're almost expecting that. Do you know what I mean? He's yeah. going to he's going to sew it into me now. Yeah, maybe he just he just completely took his eyes off him or maybe he did see it coming. But it just like we were talking the last few weeks about um, the Tipperary final, McCormick and Behan in the Kilkenny final. And we were saying how enjoyable it was to watch those games when the thing, the game was let flow and the play was ju- like, none of these kind of soft things were really blown for and the rest yeah. just let them on. Like, and to be honest, like from Johnny Murphy, I've seen him referee a, a good few games. And I remember I was watching the Wexford Dublin game this year in the league. And the stat after was that he gave 50 frees in that game. And he ref Cork and Tip in the league this year as well. And there was a whole heap of frees. Like, a lot of them for these offences that are so minor, like, you know, yeah. like maybe grabbing someone's arm, like, but it's not, it's not a non-contact sport, like, and the minute Noel McGrath did this and I seen him walking over to the linesman, I knew, like, you, you just knew there was a red card coming and, like, it was, it was very unjust because Noel McGrath, he, he was hurling very well as well. He was just, it was, a, it was a shoulder. You see that the whole time in games and, like, it it did of course took the sting out the sting out a lot more because he's their main man and especially when he was hurling well too. Yeah, the only thing I can understand uh, explain. Uh, Johnny Murphy seems to be like I mean he's on like some sort of a mission to clean up hurling or something mm. or, or maybe he doesn't like to let it flow. He didn't get the memo from hurling people. He doesn't like to let the game flow. We know that about him. Do you, he didn't see this, Lee. So he went to his linesman. His linesman could not possibly have seen it because um, Paddy Levy's back was to him. So the only thing I can think of is that the linesman thought that Noel McGrath gave him the shoulder and the front of the hurl maybe into the stomach because again Paddy Levy fell now like he was you know shot yeah he must have assumed that he sort of like driv the bottom of the hurl into him or something because of the way he went down but uh, based on that alone like the fact you can't make a decision just on someone's reaction and that's effectively what they did in the end Um, hurling our football like you see them all of the time and if you were going to give a red card for that then there'd be two three four red cards in every single game in, in, in the GAA, like it would be, you talk about cleaning up the sport, but like, uh, that's just too far to be honest. And then the fact that he didn't see it at all sort of alleviates any blame from the, from Paddy himself to, uh, in terms of play acting and stuff, because like it's the referee's responsibility in the end. And if you, if you didn't see it and the linesman doesn't have a full view of it, you can't just go in, assume the worst and flash a raid. Well, that's the way I would be thinking of it. Like, I mean, you could, you haven't seen it. Your linesman, uh, it, it, linesman couldn't have seen it because all he could see was somebody's back. It's Noel McGrath. We're not talking about a well-known hatchet man here now. 
Do you know what I mean? You give Noel McGrath the benefit of the doubt here. You know, like, I mean, you know what he is. He's an honourable player. He's not, there's not an ounce of dirt in him. That's what kind of frustrated me. If in doubt with Noel McGrath, it's not a, it's, it's not a dirty strike because it's not in him. That's not the way he plays, you know, the game. That's the annoying thing. Then the John McGrath one was, was farcical altogether. Now, while we're not going to be very critical of Paddy Levy, and I have a lot of time for Coughlin. I, I like him. I've had him on the show before. Um, but what he did now was ridiculous. A big, strong fullback. He got a tiny little touch. Not only did he go down, um, not only did he go down pretending that he was half dead, two or three of the Bally Gunner lads went running to the lines or to the umpire, put a lot of pressure on the umpire to get John McGrath sent off. Incredibly, not only did John McGrath get sent off for this, which was nothing. Now, it was a very soft penalty anyways. Mm. Probably wasn't a penalty. penalty, It was not a penalty. But the, the penalty was overturned. That penalty would have put one in it. One in it. This was a really big, important part of the game. And I don't think ba- Coughlin or Ballygunner covered themselves in glory here at all. Like this is a this is a game. They're a brilliant <coughs> team, Ballygunner. A brilliant team, dominating Waterford. This is a game on television, and this is what everyone's talking about. That Ballygunner are divers. Mm, I suppose, yeah. It's just like when you're in a team, and isn't that the the thing you'll kind of do anything? You'll do yeah. anything, and you'll go to any sort of lengths to win, and. I was just amazed at how we can, the... We can say, like, I, I agree with it. And I do think lads are going to any lengths. So, and I probably, I'm, I'm wondering, driving up in the car today, says, would I go down like that if it was barely touched? I can't say I wouldn't. But that's not to say that it's not poxy and it's not terrible for the game, that some individuals are prepared to do that. Oh, it, it, it is, like, and that's the, that's the problem. Like, there's so much of it in the game now. Like, lads are going down... And we've seen it in the in the football at the weekend as well. Lads are going down and they're calling at the refs and they're looking for cards. And it's it's part of the game. It's co- becoming a little bit like soccer now where it's just like lads are seeing it as an opportunity now every time they have the ball yeah. and going to, you're nearly drawing the contact and looking for the free. And it's, uh, it's a terrible thing to see really because like just going back to what we were talking about, the Kilkenny and Tip finals, like there was none of that kind of thing. It was just lads lads knew they, they weren't going to get the free yeah. for that sort of thing. And I suppose that comes back to the referee as well in that sense, in that, like, if, if it's like Behan or McCormick as the ref in the tip in Kilkenny finals, lads know they're not going to get a free if they're diving. Like, and I suppose when Johnny Murphy is kind of pulling for every little indiscretion and they see a lad go down, they know that he's going to, he's going to come out with the card. Like, and it was the same thing with... Um, with Barry Cockle, I was just amazed at how quick he went down. Like John McGrath had barely flicked him, and he was I barely da- even see what John McGrath did. I'd sort of wind it twice to see Two what or he three actually times did. Times I watched it, and Stephen O'Keefe and I think it was Ian Kenny were over to umpire in a flash. Like they were over so quick to him, and it was as if they seen it coming. Like and I don't. It was a flick across the hand, and like it, it might be sore enough, but I don't think it it would have warranted him like staying down as he did. Like in fairness to John McGrath. He took. He took it. I was amazed at how well he took it. Like he handed the ball over to the ref, and he Tap walked away. Back, gave Barry Cochran the yeah. tap. Like and it. It like it is mad that it was down to one point at that stage. If Lockmore got the penalty, like. yeah, yeah, and like I mean that was like squeaky bum time at that stage. That's why it's so frustrating. But the sim- this simulation thing, like I mean, it's very very hard to see on a hurling field because hurling is such a manly kind of gladiatorial type game that we're all used to. Seeing hurlers doing it, I have a terrible problem. With. Seeing footballers doing it, I have a terrible problem with it as well. Like we talked about Keen Ward's red card uh, not so long ago. You can't really tackle somebody, you know, into the chest anymore or they're acting like they've whiplash and going off on their back, like they've been clotheslined in the, you know, in the WWF. And it is sneaking into the game, Lee. And the, the, the disappointing thing is, like you watch a, guy, a game of soccer now and it could be nil all and there could be a last minute penalty and the player could blatantly dive and cheat to get that penalty. Clearly. And in the analysis after the game, there won't even be a mention of that cheating. It's like it's just an accepted part of the game. And like, I mean, I think that's a terrible road that, to go down. That's why I'm going hard on Barry Cochran. And I think it, it should be highlighted. And, and I do take, I take Niall's point that Barry Cochran, clever enough fella, saw how finicky Murphy is and, you know, went, look here, well, I can gain an advantage here. And is it Barry's fault? I'm admitting I'd probably do the same thing. So like, I mean... I think the problems with the finicky referee that if there's a if there's an opportunity for for players when they see a finicky referee to make the most of this, do you know what I mean? Are they at fault or like I don't know? Like I mean, what's the, what's the solution here? How can we get to a point where we're not in four or five years time with this kind of thing going on in a match and we're just ignoring it because there, you know there's no there's no turning turning back on it now. 
Yeah, I mean, I certainly don't have a solution, but uh, what you're saying is completely correct about being accountable for it. And in terms of us in the media and this podcast and stuff, you have to call it out. You don't want to get to the stage where uh, it's normalized like it is in soccer, you know, to the point where they barely even comment on it anymore. Um, in that situation, especially with Harlem, just with the reputation of it and stuff as well, these big hardy men. <laughs> You do have to think that maybe there is an element of cleverness to it in the sense that, like Niall was saying, this, this referee is known for this. You know, like it's the kind of referee that he is. Um, Bally Gunner maybe had that in the back of their head saying, this fellow would flash the cards. You yeah. know, if, if you get, if you concede a free, you know, maybe try to get a reaction or in this case, concede a penalty, try to get a reaction, see if we can get it overturned. You know, like, and, and that comes down to, uh, I suppose, a respectable level of preparation from that team but yeah and then in that sense you do got to point the finger at the referee and you got to just um hold him accountable and say that like the game's worse for this you know he's not protecting anyone's players he's not making the game safer it's if anything you know it's just sort of ruining the credibility of it yeah no I completely agree on a more positive note Stephen O'Keefe in the first half some unbelievable saves from John McGrath really important ones as well um you know, like, I mean, there was Desi Hutchinson, you know, fantastic again. Jeez, I have to say, like, Desi, the ball they give Desi Hutchinson. Like, it's like, they're like, I'd say, like, Hurling wouldn't always be known. Like, they're Gaelic football passes. They give him passes that Gaelic football inside forwards gets. I can't give him a better compliment than that. It's controlled. It's perfect. It's just in front of him. You know, like, I mean, you'd feel like I can't think the Lockmore number four. Like, I mean, it, that, Desi Hutchinson <coughs> with that kind of service is unmarkable. And I think it was Joey Hennessy was on him yesterday and... When the ball came into Desi Hutchinson, you just felt for Hennessy because it was hopping in front of him. And Desi has this, he's that little shimmy, he has the speed then to take him on. And like when he had, he had a good bit of space too, didn't he? Like he, yeah. he space to move into either side. And that might have been a bit naive from Lockmore Castellani. They, they don't really play that extra man back there. Yeah, the first two the first two balls that went in, it was like they were wide open, like and you thought they were like you thought they were in serious trouble. And in fairness, like it wasn't the best Bally Gunner performance, really. Like because apart from Stephen O'Keefe and Desi Hutchinson, well, the, the Mahonies, in fairness, did well for the goals. There wasn't any real standout, really, other than Desi Hutchinson out the field. And there was a long part of that game in the middle when Lockmore were down to fourteen men, and they were miles on top. Like your man Kieran Connolly in midfield, he was he was completely bossing the game, and John Maher was the same. Um, it, I suppose it just wasn't Bally Gunner. At their best yesterday, but no. they they still have that bit of magic, and it, it does all hinge on Desi Hutchinson. In fairness, and like he he was kind of that was his first year back the year they lost to Barcelona, and I suppose he was kind of only settling in then. But when he's so good now, like even the pass he gave for that second goal for was it it was Mikey Mahoney like Mikey that was Mahoney. that was a bit of genius. It was a great like. goal. That was just a one-two kind of move. Now Desi didn't want to give that back. It was only when Desi turned and realized, yeah. okay, there's nothing on for me. I'll give it back to him. But his first instinct was to actually go here. I'm in here myself. You thought he was in, yeah, and that was the thing. But they they have that bit of magic is what I'm trying to say. When he's in the team, like he yeah, just yeah. he gives them that, and there's very few defenders that can live with him. Yeah, there were managers after the match, uh, Lee. Frankie McGrath was given out about the pitch. And, like, I mean, he has a point. He says, that's no disrespect. Um, it's, it's no disrespect to the people who look after the pitch. They do the best that they can. Big teams in Leinster can go to Croke Park to play their games. If they want the club season to happen at this time of the year, when well, it's always been at this time of the year, they're talking about the split season, then take the games to the playable pitches. Porky Keeve isn't too far from here. An outstanding facility. Why couldn't it have been played there? I completely agree with this. And this is something the GEA need to look at very, very quickly because we want the split season. We want this time of the year to be absolutely fantastic. Well, maybe it won't be this time of the year. It'll be at least a month. It'll be a month earlier. So we'll be in the middle of November um, when we're playing these games, you know, probably every year now with the split st- season, inter-county season ending um, on the 24th of July. So club season should be starting 1st of August. We should be... October, November should be the provincial championships. We want these to be really big, um, you know, a huge competition. We have the inter-county finished very early in the year. We want something to replace, you know, something big for that four weeks. And I think the provincial championships in football and hurling can be that big, huge product. I think, it, like I've always said, it should have a, a, a Sunday game type show. If RT don't want to bother their arse is doing it, Give the, give the rights to Virgin uh, TV or to somebody who wants to make a good product out of this. But they have to be played on good pitches. And I take that completely like they shouldn't be played on bogs. There's nothing we can do about the weather, Lee, but we can absolutely do 
something about the pitches at this time of the year and what is wrong with Parky Keeve? Why can't that game be played where there's no question that this pitch is in perfect uh, condition and while we can, like I said we can't do anything about wind and rain we can definitely uh, sort out a terribly boggy cut up field. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it all comes down to how much you want to respect the provincial championships and, you know, and giving it the respect that it deserves. Like we talked a little bit earlier about TV clashes with county finals early on and how that definitely shouldn't be a situation. You know, we should be treating the provincial championship as the next step up from the county championships and it should get all the airs and graces of that. And that includes, obviously, its location, includes the time of the day, you know, and the TV rights where it slots in that. Um, I definitely agree with the, with the sort of uh, Sunday game sort of element of it as well. There should be highlights of all of the games uh, sitting somewhere for us to watch. Maybe the split season, given the fact that I know like it's only going to be a month earlier, but like they know what's coming now. You know, like this is it. Like we shouldn't be. Hopefully, fingers crossed. You know, worrying about uh, calendar changes with COVID and all the rest of it. Let's let's start now. You know, and, and prepare for the full season ahead and give it the respect that it deserves, basically. Yeah, no, I I completely agree. These provincial championships are absolutely brilliant. They are inter-county games, just including clubs, and it should be treated like inter-county games as far as it should be given the full treatment at this this stage of the year. Uh, Mount Bellew, My Lock versus Pierce's. This was, uh, wasn't even on television, but was on the Connacht GA website, um, I believe. This was a messy ending to this game. Now, this kind of hinged on some very, very bad refereeing as well, I have to say, because I watched the last Now I have to say I didn't watch all this game. It wasn't. I watched the second, most of the second half of it um, this morning. But I suppose while you would say there were mistakes everywhere on the field, you know, throughout the game, which is normal, there was refereeing mistakes. Mount Bellew, my luck, can feel very, very aggrieved at maybe the last five minutes of the game. Barry McHugh in particular. Now, Barry McHugh didn't cover himself in glory at all. He ran to the referee and he pushed the referee. Now, not a big push. He didn't push the referee into the ground. He kind of just gave him a little push and that was it. The rest of the Mount Bellew, my lock players came in, tried to, you know, calm the situation down and they surrounded the referee. It didn't look great, but I don't think there was any too, you know, too much major about it. It was a bit of an ugly scene. But Mount Bellew, my lock will or feel aggrieved that there was a foul on Barry McHugh where one of the Pierce's players kind of launched at him with a shoulder and Barry McHugh kind of got tripped up. This was on 26 minutes, 49 seconds of the second half. You have to remember, this was a draw match at this stage. Barry McHugh is a brilliant free taker. This was maybe five metres inside the 45. You'd have fancied him. They were into the wind. Then the referee sent off Matthew Barrett, 27 minutes and 15 seconds into the, into the second half. Again, in around a draw match, it was a second yellow. There was absolutely nothing in this. It was a farcical sending off. Terrible. And we know how important Matthew Barrett is in midfield for, for Mount Bellier, my lock, especially for kickouts. Then he gave an incredibly soft free to Pierce's on the 28th minute and 12 seconds. Now, you have to remember, there's one minute between all these incidents and Mount Bellier, my lock are going, jeez, he's over us, he's riding us. And now look, another one and another one. It's building. And it's building and building now to a crescendo. So... On the 28 minutes, he gave a, a free for Pierce's, which was nothing but, I think it was Niall Daly, a complete another dive. Uh, or did, It was a dive to send, get Matthew Barrett sent off. Then it was a terribly soft free uh, for Pierce's. This was on the 45 metre line. The referee then, Mount Bellew, my lock, were getting very frustrated at this stage and the referee brought it up right to the top of the D. Incredibly, Hubert Darcy actually missed that free. He put it in the goalie's hands. A bit like Keane Ward, you know, when you have one on the top of the D, it's so easy maybe to lose concentration. But anyways, he brought that forward. And then probably the, the worst mistake the referee made. So this is 32 minutes and four seconds. There was three minutes of injury time. So you're two minutes into it and Mount Bellew, my lock, had held this ball into the wind for maybe two minutes recycled it over back over back controlling it until Michael Daly or Michal Daly kicked in a long ball into Barry McHugh and he made he had an absolutely fantastic mark mm. caught it um, spectacular really and I'm not against I'm against the mark but this is exactly the type of mark I kind of had envisaged a good kick from outside the 45 a great catch under pressure fell on the ground and his hand in the air referee did nothing and Barry McHugh had to get up off the ground and hand pass it off. And then he started shouting at the referee. So there's like, I mean, that's another one. So they'll feel that was to put them one point up. Then all would have been left was a kick out and maybe the game over. Uh, Parry Pierce's go down the field. And which daily was it? Ronan Daly that... Uh, it was Hubert Darcy who did the flick and passed it on. I'm nearly sure it was to Connor Daly. Oh, Connor I Daly. Think, yeah. Connor Daly kicked an absolute screamer. Yeah. Now from the next kick out... Pierce's all Everyone. did. Remember Kilkenny or Dublin did it to Mayo in the All Ireland final. They all just held the Mount Bellum My Luck players. 
right? So the ball was kicked out. It went near Barry McHugh. Barry McHugh kind of had lost his head at this stage and he fouled the Porrick Pierce's uh, player. Referee blew the full-time whistle. Barry McHugh had lost his mind at this stage, ran over. And I think he actually showed a lot of restraint, actually, because he was, he was so mad. He just gave a little, tiny little push to the referee. Can't do that and he could be in trouble for it. Rest of the Mount Bellew, my luck, lads, surrounded the referee. But there were more, a lot of them were trying to push Barry away from him. Um, and that's pretty much it. I saw the, the, the ugly scenes getting a lot of coverage, whereas the absolutely horrific performance in the closing stages, you know, one after another after another, that led up to this. I'd like to see that having gotten a little bit more coverage now. You would, yeah. Because, like, as, as we were saying about Johnny Murphy, like refs, they should be held accountable, like as players are, as managers are, like when they have the bad performance, like they should probably feel the effects of it too like and like you would you would feel for like you can see why Barry McHugh was was so mad like because like that was like Michael Daly at that stage like that was a brilliant pass to put in and it took a bit of bravery to send that pass in as well because the game was it was on a knife edge at that point and it did need a little bit of magic and that was exactly what it was from Daly a brilliant pass in and McHugh's mark as you said it was it was a spectacular catch and he probably would have scored that to win it so like, and the build up of all those decisions you ran through, you can see why they were cross. But at the same time, like you, you just can't, like there has to be a little bit of respect towards officials. And even yeah. when you are mad, you have to have a little bit of restraint in your head to tell you like, this is something that I just cannot do. Oh, like, I agree. Because and Barry McHugh is going to be in trouble. I'm sure he will get mm. some sort of a suspension. I don't think any of the other Mo- Mount Bellia My Lock players deserve it. No, your man Billy Mannion, he was the fullback and he was in trying to throw the rest of them away like and he was trying to kind of protect the referee and you'd have to give him a bit of a shout out for that too because like it wasn't it wasn't it was it was it was it's something you don't want to see at an end of, at the end of a game but like I'm not defending the Mount Bellew my lock players but I suppose it's just they they made a mistake and the referee made a mistake as well like both both people made mistakes and Mount Bellew are the ones that are probably going to they're going to suffer more for it I'd say this is the thing like I mean I presume like you know from what I saw this was a pretty evenly matched game it's again a terrible wind in it as well Lee like I mean I'm not trying to take away from Pori Pierce's and say Mount Bellew my luck deserve to win this game but this refereeing decision literally changed the outcome of that game like I mean it was absolutely massive if it had been a draw gone to extra time Pori Pierce's won it then you know you, would, you wouldn't say too, too much about it it you know it just I would feel for Mount Bellew, my luck, like having having come through a full year of blood, sweat and tears, you know, to to feel aggrieved like that at the at the last minute. And I, and I know there's, listen, there's loads of diff- decisions that go for you and against you throughout the match, but you can't compare an airy bad decision with a decision that you literally have no time left in the game to ever, you know, be able to kind of uh, rectify. Yeah. No, that, and that's exactly it too. And then like now it's saying there about holding the referee accountable. And I just think, especially at this level, when there's so much more on the line, you just have to hold them accountable and they have to, you know, stick their hand up and admit when they're wrong as well. Because this, this, yeah, it just build and it build and it build. And then that last with, with the mark, uh, it, it was, you can totally see why they were completely uh, enraged and, and infuriated by that. But uh, you got to caveat by, that by saying like, you can't, you just can't put your hands on a referee in, no. in any circumstances. Uh, I was reading up on it and apparently if they're going to get the referee's match report and if it says anywhere on it that there was minor physical interference which counts down as pushing, shove, or jostling, shoving, pulling or even threatening language then that's a 12-week suspension on the player. Like I mean, So that's how easy you know, it is to do that. Like, yeah. And it could be... Um, things will get a lot worse now for my value because he, you know, he didn't have that restraint in the end. But um, there definitely needs to be a look you know, just because that happened I don't think, you know, he should be let off the hook either in terms of them decisions um, and it should definitely be reviewed. Well, that's it. Like, I mean, there's no excuse in putting your hands on a referee, but it was very, very minimal now. It wasn't this that wasn't designed to hurt a referee or in any way, shape or form. He It was a half hearted push that it was more frustration. Like dear McConnelly at the time with the linesman. Like, I mean, that was, you know, I saw people saying this was an assault on the referee. It was not. 
like the Dermot Connolly thing was harmless too like I mean you know only by the letter of the law Connolly got the suspension like what he did to the referee was kind of minimal at the time and what Barry McHugh did again I'm not saying you should do it N- under no circumstances should you do it it looks terrible you're letting yourself down I kind of I understand the frustration but like I said the same as Dear McConnelly he did it and he'd, he'd got, he'll suffer the consequences for doing it and you wouldn't have that much sympathy on him because he did do it at the end of the day now Yeah he just, just kind of lost the head in that moment like we can see why he lost the head but still at the same time if you lose the head yeah. you know you're going to get in trouble and you deserve it Like, Yeah I completely agree Right so Clock Balakala are in the Leinster final after upsetting the odds on Saturday night in Moor Park and their captain Picky Marr joins us on the line now How's it going Picky? Well, Willie, how are things? Not, not too bad, not me and yourself. I'm sure it's very, very good for you. Like, I mean, 2021 has been some year for you, boys. Yeah, it's, it's been an incredible year, I suppose. Um, to, to win the two county finals was, was brilliant. And then we kind of exceeded expectations, I suppose. we have gone on to beat the referees. And then the other night, beating Kilmacug Crokes. It was just an unbelievable feeling, unbelievable for the club in general. And, just been brilliant. It's been a roller coaster year, but it's been a great year. Yeah, so like the roller coaster is staying up pretty high. It hasn't come down yet, uh, thankfully. <laughs> but you, you've been able to ride this momentum that you have, Picky. So obviously, it started with the county final. You're only beaten with leash, and then you have to prepare for a county final. And since then, you've been able to keep the pitch kind of going. Yeah, no, it was it was, it was strange, I suppose, coming into the first county final because we got knocked out with leash, and you kind of had a month to kind of get everything ready to go for the county final and in some ways it didn't it didn't feel like county final I suppose because after being out off with your club so long it was just trying to get everything in order and thankfully we won that one and then it's kind of it was kind of a snowball effect I suppose it kind of just stayed going for us and thankfully we got the 2021 final as well and Things just gathered momentum from there. Like, what was that like when you, you finished up with Leash? Because I know myself from when I was playing with Leash and you'd be out with Port Leash, like I mightn't even go training for maybe a week or two just to get my head back. Look, I need to fi- I need to finish with Leash and then, you know, I want to get going then uh, with Port Leash. But that would be for a first round. You, you, <laughs> like, you kind of had to move on to get ready for a county final. Yeah, it was strange, like, because we were trying to, just a few county lads that we have, we were trying to dip our heads into training and just kind of show a face and kind of keep everything together. But we had no, we got a couple of days off after leash, but you can't really down tools for too long because no. we knew we had a, a huge challenge ahead of us for the 2020 county final against Burris and Ostrickley Cotton. So it was strange at times, but I think you just have to keep the shoulder to the wheel and just try to get get everyone ready for, for the biggest game I suppose So what did you do with your 2021 speech did you just use the speech that you had for 2020 <laughs> 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 I, uh, I actually had this conversation with my sister when, when I came to the final day I'd I do, done the speech the morning of the final and I actually still had the 2020 speech and I said well I just used the same thing but <laughs> obviously I didn't want to get too ahead of myself either you have to prepare for the worst too and I just changed a few lines around, I suppose, and it still worked. And anyway. thankfully, we, I I got to say the speech, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. Claire, what what do you put the difference down to then this year? Well, it's this year and last year. You know, Declan Laffin is the obvious one that's come in, but you won one in two thousand and fifteen. You know, and you you'd gone four or five years then without kind of getting it back. Yeah, it's it's hard to put your finger on. I suppose I think Declan Declan has been very good. He's kind of just brought things back to basics. Basics. He doesn't overcomplicate things like trainings. Like the drills are simple drills, but sometimes the simple drills are the best drills, I suppose. And he's just kind of concentrated on working hard and winning dirty ball, and just kind of getting everyone rowing in the same direction, I suppose. And the, the group of players we have now at the minute, like everyone is just kind of so close with each other, and it's it's great. There's a great team spirit amongst us all. So I, it's hard to put your finger on it, but I definitely I'd say that just because we're so close and and um, we're all rolling in the same direction. I think it's, it's brilliant. Right. Okay. Like I mean, because that's it. Like there seems to be a harder edge to you or something now. Yeah, there probably there probably is. I suppose from from we'll say early on in twenty twenty, like we probably no one would have really given us a hope of even winning one, let alone the back to back. So it probably comes with confidence, I suppose, as well. Like we haven't been best, we'll say in either championship twenty twenty or twenty twenty one. So you kind of the team grows in confidence and. Everyone just, it picks up momentum and it kind of just, it snowball effects from there. But 
it's um, it's great. It's great at the minute, anyway. You you'd have been forgiven considering that you won the two county titles, you know, so close to each other. Then you Willie Dunphy stag, um, you know, and then you're out yeah. in the in the Leinster club. You'd probably be forgiven for saying we have enough done this year, but that didn't seem to be the way you were thinking at all. No, I, I kind of say in years gone by that winning the county final would have been would have been enough for us. Like obviously you want to progress, but. At the back of it all, in some ways, you'd nearly be happy because it can be so hard to win to win a county final. You'd nearly, you'd nearly be happy with that. But I think, as I said, this team it just seems a, a bit different um, last year and this year that we kind of want to get the most out of it. We've a great crop of players at the minute, and these days they don't come around too often. So it, it's it's brilliant that um, that we are where we are now, and we kind of just wanted to, to get that first win in Leinster, and thankfully we've done that, and we just said we'd drive on from there and try to see see how far we could go. Yeah, one the good thing about Clock Balakala is like I mean the the spread of the county boys you have. You have a good few county boys, you know, with county experience, but they're on nearly every line of the field, you know, which is important. Yeah, it, it makes a huge difference. I think someone said to me during the week. I think that there was only two lads that never played county, whether it be under twenty or at senior level, or would have had a year in with leash or two years in with leash. So it's very important, like that we have we kind of have lads all over the field and in, in every lane of, of the field, as you said. So. It's it's great to have that experience, like because some teams don't don't have that experience, and and when, when it's called upon and it's needed, I think our lads our lads have delivered every time. So it, it, it's very important, I suppose. It was three, I think three to one. You were to beat Kilmacud the other night, like I mean, and you never really looked like you were going to lose it. You like I mean, you had a brilliant start. Your goal was fantastic. Like you just threw your man off you, like you were, like he was you know a sack of spuds. Um, just <laughs> threw threw him off your back, get off me, and, and buried it. And you, like, I mean, it was a ve- like a, an assured performance. Yeah, it probably was. It, like coming into the game, like we were always, we always thought we had a great chance. We always we, we believed ourselves that we'd win the game. Obviously, but I think like no one, no one really gave us a chance. Everyone was writing us off. And sometimes coming in as the underdog, it's a great place to be. Like and. As you said, it was it was a very good performance from us because I know after the referees game, just from talking to the lads, we were disappointed with the performance. I think some lads said it was probably the worst worst performance we've given some time, but well, especially over the last two years. But um, it was great to just back up that back up the performance the other night, like with with a serious serious performance and serious work rate from everyone. So, but it, as you said, it probably probably was our best performance, and we looked kind of comfortable throughout, I suppose, until. I suppose they got that goal to bring it back to a point, but as we've done in all the games, I suppose we kind of just kicked on again. So it was brilliant. It was nervy enough now the last the last minute or two, all right, but thankfully we held out. Yeah, that's the kind of steel that I think you have this year. That you're, you know, you go down to Boris Kilcotton by seven points a couple of times. You know, Kilma could get the goal to go back to a point. You know, you 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 answer any question that's asked. You know, off in in the matches. Yeah, especially especially this year. As I said in a few interviews after some of the games, like in years gone by, when someone got a goal on us, we might have dropped their heads and we could have we could have lost the games by three or four points or whatever it was. But I think this year we just have that extra bit of steel, I suppose. And they took against in the semi final against Rathdowney Earl, like down by seven points, down a man before half time. Like it's all about just digging in, I suppose, and, and finding a way back. And that's definitely something we've we've done this year. And it was the same in the county final down by seven points again against a serious Boris and Ashley Cotton team and you just have to dig deep and try to get the next keep tagging on the points and thankfully in, in that game we didn't get the lead till the, the 58th minute but it's all about holding out with that stage and thankfully we've done that yeah you, you definitely did like I mean you're getting great exposure Clock Balakala everybody knows about Clock Balakala now because like I mean the minute you get a run in the province the whole country uh, kind of notices whereas the, you, you wouldn't really know what's going on within a county and you've been on RTE the last two games as well so for anyone who doesn't know now like describe how big a place Clock Balakala is for anyone who, who still isn't sure wh- what they're dealing with here Oh, sure, God, it's not, it's not that big at all. It's, it's, a, it's a tiny little parish, I suppose, with two little schools. Um, I think the school that I went to, Bala College, I think if there's even 30 pupils in it now between the whole school, that's about eight, I think. And the two schools, between the two of them, they've only five teachers. So it's kind of, it's a close-knit community. Like, it's a tiny little spot, but like, it's nearly, in Bala College, you blink, you miss it, you're gone through it. And that's, <laughs> that's about it. Like, we've a church, one shop, and a, and a pub. That's, that's about it, like, but... The wind the other night. I never seen so many people crying after a match between players and supporters. Just it just goes to show what it meant to 
such a small community. Well, but that's the thing, though. But you're you're on the go since two, is it two thousand and nine when you won the first one in a long, long time. So, like, I mean, y- you know, it's not just one team we're dealing with here from such a you know a tiny place. No, it's not. No, it's two thousand nine was the first one. I think in I don't know what it was eighty three or eighty four years or something like that. Um, and I suppose I wasn't on that team. I came on came in it in twenty ten. It was my first year, but. You you grow on up with some of them lads, and a lot of them lads have are, aren't part of are, aren't part of the team now. So it's a totally different group of players. And I think over the last few years, probably the last three four years, people are saying we're an aging team and we won't be back. But I think as it stands now, I think we've only maybe three lads kind of on the starting team over thirty, and we're we're a fairly young team now. So you'd like to think we would be able to kick on, but I know you have, just have to make the most of the times because. They don't. They don't last forever. Your day comes comes and goes very quick. Well, that's true. That's true. Come here. You're flying it this year. Like I mean, I think I was. You have. Is it what? How many goals did you, did you have you scored? I have won seventy two here, but that can't be right because is it five seventy two from seven games? Um, you know, like you're really in good scoring form. Yeah. No. I had a had a pretty good year, I suppose, um, between twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one, and. I don't know, you just kind of, sometimes you find form. I've had years where it's been brutal as well, so when when the good comes, you just have to take it, I suppose, and, and you, you get confidence from that, and um, just being the captain with Cluck Balakali, you kind of have to you kind of have to show your experience and lead from the front, I suppose, and that's what I've tried to do for the last, for the last two years, and thankfully it's working out with the minute anyway. Yeah, no, definitely. I think you're trying to chew, uh, prove to Cheddar Plunkett that you're not a wing-back. That's why you're playing so well in the forwards. <laughs> <laughs> He, he tried to make me into wing back, but I'm not so sure if that's going to work or not. But uh, I'm try, trying to give him another option, maybe in the full forward lane as well. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Come here, did you send spies to to Tullamore yesterday? I presume you did. Uh we we had we had a couple of people over there, and anyway. I don't like to give too much away now. But <laughs> I know we kind of we kind of know what we're facing now in Bally Hills. Sure, look, they're they're one of the best club teams maybe ever ever to to play the game and. We know what we're kind of up against. We know all the we know all the, the talent they have and the big players they have. So it's going to be a fairly tough task now in the Leinster final. But no different than the other day. We'll be right off again and and look. We'll we'll put a shoulder to the wheel and see what we can do. Yeah, exactly. And Crow Park, lovely a lovely venue for the final just before Christmas. It's all kind of landed nicely. Yeah, no, it's brilliant because there were talks of the semi-final being played in Crow Park and I think lads were a bit disappointed maybe that it didn't come to Crow Park so right. to go to go, to go to Crow Park with your club is, is something special I suppose and, and I think I'd say I speak for everyone on the team I don't think anyone ever imagined that a club by the team would, would be playing in Crow Park and it's important it's important that we relish it too but as, as we say we're not going up there just to fulfil the fixture and make up the numbers we're going there to try and beat Ballyhale Shamrocks and, and that's what we'll try and do Well listen best of luck Picky uh, where did you get Picky by, uh, uh, from by the way? <laughs> I was expecting that question <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I knew I wasn't going to get away without it um, <laughs> I, I actually have it since I was very young probably one or two years of age I think I have it since um, my young I used to go around I used to pick in bins I know it's very strange but <laughs> when, you're, when you're a young fella you don't know what you're doing and my uncle used to say Jesus is awful picky isn't he and it kind of stuck ever since and no one really calls me Stephen now anymore so I'm just I'm used to it yeah well it's a bit like myself if I'm called Colm I'm in trouble I think you're the same <laughs> yeah the exact same yeah, yeah. <laughs> well listen Picky best of luck next week against um, against uh, Ballyhill Shamrocks and let's hope you do it um, it'd be a great win for Leash Hurling so best of luck I'll talk to you again perfect thanks a million Willie see you bye bye yeah, great stuff from Picky there. So listen, I'm looking forward to this uh, Leinster final. It's a strange one that the Leinster final is on next weekend, but the Munster final is three weeks away after Christmas. So they have to drag across the whole way after Christmas, Niall. I'm not really sure why that is. Yeah, and I'm not sure which one I'd prefer. Really oh, I'd either. prefer next weekend. I suppose, actually, Jesus. Yeah, when you think about it. But in fairness, the pubs and the nightclubs aren't open really to, to great extents this weather, so... It's going to be a quiet Christmas anyway. If Clap Balakala win the Leinster final, the pubs will be open. They'll find right? somewhere, I'd say. <laughs> Certainly will. Bally Hill Shamrocks, talking about bloody who they play in the final. So I was uh, texting a friend of mine who was over at this and he says, text me, he says, Bally Hill are in big trouble here. He says, but they'll probably dig it out. And I kind of, you know, thought, you know the way the favourite always finds a way to get, get out of it. Like this is literally the last 65. Bally Hill Shamrocks are three points down. 
the last 65 of the game like what would you give it would you give it 1 in 20 or something maybe or 1 in 20 where you might less 1 in 50 maybe because think of the amount of times you see this mm. and it's just cleared out like I mean this is tiny percentage this is a team that has players on that team that have five All Ireland medals, five All Ireland clubs. They have more All Ireland clubs than any other club in the whole in the whole country. The next best is Portumna on four and Burr on four. TJ Reid has five on his own. Colin Fenley has five. Uh, Owen Reid. Owen Reid, well, the corner yeah. forward. There's a few of them have five All Ireland clubs. They're up against it away from home against St. Ryan's and Connor Park, where the game is completely turned against them. They're flying it in the first half with the wind, and now the game is turned against them. Rhinos have their tails up. We're in big trouble here. The last 65. And these lads are able to... I think T, was it TJ Reid caught it or he broke it down and Owen Cody got a, a, a pull on it on the ground. Goal. Isn't it Ryan just, is gone. Oh, it's an unbelievable mark of Ballyhale, really, that... Isn't it, though? Like, even when... like I was, I was watching Kilmallock and Middleton when this was on and I wasn't even watching it because I had the radio for the Rhinos game, Rhinos and Ballyhale, and that was just taken over, like, and didn't give a crap about Kilmallock and Middleton at that stage, like, and I remember with 10 minutes to go, the commentator, he said, he came out with a brilliant line, he said, um, TJ Reid got married last week, but the honeymoon ended in Tullamore today, like, because <laughs> TJ was really, he was really struggling. He was getting hurled out of it by Ben Keneally, who's the awfully captain, like, and just TJ has, and TJ, I suppose, he just epitomises Bally Hale that he has that in him and we were listening to the radio we're saying like you know Bally like Ryan is our three three points up Ron Hughes got the great goal and they've all the momentum but Bally it, it would be like Bally Hale now to get a goal like and to ruin it and for it to come in the like four minutes into injury time like you've even given up on Bally Hale nearly at that stage yeah. like and well I was thinking 65. of Clock Balakala at that stage because you're kind of following it on Twitter and like Jesus they have a great chance now mm. Do you know what I mean? No disrespect to Rhinos, but like, I mean, Ballyhale, that would have been more of a 50-50 game. And then the goal goes in, you go, Jesus. How did it do? And when it went extra time, like you knew there was only going to be one outcome there. Like you knew Ballyhale ah, was going yeah. to. And they were saying in the commentary that, oh, Rhinos are going so well and Rhinos are fit and they'll be, they'll do well here. Like you just knew Ballyhale once, once you get your chance against a team like that, like you know you have to take it and I suppose Rhinos they'll be absolutely sick this morning like I was we were definitely shouting for them like Ken Hogan from my club is the manager and yeah. we were mad for, for Rhinos to win that game but you just have to take your hat off to Ballyhale like because they were down to 14 men time was up everything the whole thing had gone against them and they found a way and sure they're going for their third All-Ireland club in a row now like they're the best like they're the best club ever like really like you know yeah. between hurling and football and this would bring them up to nine All Ireland clubs if they win it uh, this year, and they're obviously favourites uh, to win as well. Their manager Lee James O'Connor said after the game, "That was the worst ten seconds of my life, nearly watching that ball carry in the air." And thankfully, one of the lads got a touch on it. I was picturing the spin on the bus on the way home um, in that last ten, 10 seconds in my head, saying, "Where did this all go wrong today?" So I'm hugely relieved. Like I mean, this ten seconds he's talking about. Probably less than 10 seconds. Well, it probably hit the ground. The whole 10 seconds from when it, that 65 was struck. Any theories on how many goals are scored in that situation? Now, Ryan has got a goal very late in the county final in, the, in a in maybe not from a free, but from a similar, si a late goal. So they'll know what it's like to be on, on the kind of winning side of that. Any theories on how many times this actually works out for you? Oh, God. Um, it feels like it never works out. For me, for me. never. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If, if, yeah, if I mean, it's you, it's, you will never score from something yeah. like that. It's, it's such a pessimistic view on it too, but when it's against you, it feels like it actually all the time, to be fair. Um, but no, like it's, it's a similar situation to um, the Dublin final, isn't it? Again, Nafina v. the Croaks, they got a very late goal. Um, Nafina had put so much in, you know, as the underdogs, just like Ryan is, they had put so much into uh, uh, getting over the line, you know, finally putting it up to the big team. And then that sucker punch just at the end and, you know, all the momentum, they in ships and they just don't have the energy and, and the extra time to go again and, and to get over this huge hurdle. While all of the momentum, of course, then was with Bally Hill and they ended up cruising that extra time in the end. I mean, it's it's it's, it's amazing what can, well, like he says, 10 seconds, it's amazing what can change in it. Exactly. We saw the we saw the highlights <laughs> of this uh, this morning. It's on GA Bio, so I'm sure it's going to be on uh, TG Cahar tonight. Um, I have to give a shout out to Luke O'Connor from St. Rhinos. He scored a goal. You'll see it on the television tonight. If anyone remembers 
uh, Shane Dowling's goal for Limerick. It was against was that against Cork? Kilkenny in the semi. That against year, Kilkenny, yeah. oh the comeback, yeah, yeah it sparked the comeback where he threw it up. It was almost like a tennis smash. So Luke, o, Luke O'Connor did that. Um, scored an absolutely fantastic goal that was Shane Dowling esque. Then you need to keep your eye out tonight for TJ Reid's point in the extra time where he just puts it out. It's like the egg and spoon race. He just puts it on the hurl and starts running in kind of in different directions and then taps it over the bar. Um, I'm not doing it justice here trying to explain it um, on the show. So keep your eye out for the for that on TG, TG Cahar tonight. And one other thing is that Ballyhill Shamrocks are going to uh, appeal. Uh, Joe Cuddy, got a straight red card. Um, it was some off the ball or a high challenge right in front of the linesman. So they reckon that it wasn't a red card. It had a huge bearing on the game because it gave Ryan as the sweeper with the wind and they took over from there. So it'll be interesting to see whether he gets back for the Leinster final live. It will be, yeah, because he's he's become a key player for them really in the wing forward there. He's been three or four points a game and like as you, as you said it was, it was such a blow for Ballyhale at that stage and from there Ryan as they took off and that Luke O'Connor goal like it was a bit. It was a piece of magic. Like just when he throws it up, you're like you're too far out to bat that one. And like he followed through with it and straight into the corner. And all the momentum with with, um, with Ryan is then. But sure. Would you be practicing him. that? Like say I, I I never hurled, but in football, if you saw a good score, you you know but you know before training starts and you're just kind of poking around or messing around, we'd take shots on the goalie. Um, like would lads in training before <laughs> the training starts start practicing that that finish now? I'd never seen that level of finish before Shane Dowling did it that time yeah like for the last two or three years like any time you're running in on goal the manager or any coach I've had they'll be saying to you don't bat. swing don't give your man a chance to hook yet just bat it and usually like you, you'll be closer when you're when you're batting it because you know it's hard to get a bit of power on it but that was the skill obviously from Luke O'Connor and from Shane Dowling back then to put the power on it as well and it's a very hard one for a keeper to stop as well because it's coming at a weird height, isn't it? Like it's coming down at him and you very rarely see them stop. Like Colin Fenley is the man who scores them goals the whole time. Yeah, early but not as far out as that. He, no. he, do, he does it when he's right on top of the goalie. Yeah, like most lads will just... now. It's, it's a big thing nowadays, lads. I think we've seen Jack O'Connor do it for Cork, didn't he, during the championship as well. Lads just keep running in because there's no point... In, if there's a lad on your tail... Like, what's the point in giving him a chance to hook you when you can run the whole way in? Like, Yeah, no, definitely true. Kilmallock beat Middleton. Well, we, we saw this game, like, I mean, this was boring in that Kilmallock were just far too good for Middleton. The game was over at half time. Um, completely, completely flat Middleton. Or maybe they're just not, not good enough Middleton. That Limerick Club Championship is much, much better than the Cork Club Championship. The Cork Clubs make no impression in the Munster Club. And... I kind of you kind of had manage the the Fitzgerald Jerry Fitzgerald the Middleton manager after the game saying oh we were we weren't at the races today but maybe you're just not like you're talking about you're talking about Kilmallock coming out of the championship that has Napierstig and and Patrick's well, and Patrick's well like I mean Cork isn't offering anything like those clubs now no sure I read um, Fintan O'Toole from the Forty Two had the stat yesterday that they've won one game in Munster since two thousand and nine like and Jesus I was. I, like, I, I thought that was mad the second I read it I was like Jesus but when you think about it you're trying to think back to the last core club that have that have done well in Munster and that have really made an impression and like you, you actually can't think of it like the bars the bars like, that's, <laughs> that's going back a long time that's like, the 70s I suppose the, the Emil Killy thing hasn't helped them in recent years where there's clubs winning or losing county finals and then they're kind of lambs to the slaughter the next day like but no a core club hurling it's <clears throat> Maybe Black Rock might have made an impression last year, but like the other counties, Tipperary, Ballygunner in Waterford, Kilmallock, whoever it is in Limerick, they just seem to be a step ahead of the Cork boys. Yeah. yeah, no, I, com- I completely agree. So Mike, Mike, or Michal Houlihan got man of the match. He's a very impressive player, I have to say. He's the same kind of, because he's such a big fella, same language style as Garod Hegarty, kind of half reminds me of him. Uh, very, very good player. It was interesting that he got, uh, or they had a seven-week wait. Uh, Tony Constantine was talking about this so they had a seven week you know, we've been kind of a bit obsessed about the seven week wait Tony Constantine just rubbished it away altogether Lee, as if we don't know what we're talking about but I think Tony Constantine is kind of manager that goes let's not start giving out about this this is going to do us no good at all oh, we didn't care about it we were delighted with the five week wait what team wouldn't want a five week wait to wait for a, Lens- or a Munster semi-final we were delighted with it so he kind of made you know made out that there was no big deal it was funny uh, Michal Hulin in his interview after the match said that they had the seven week wait and they, they were given two weeks off and a whole other team headed off to Barbados so maybe that's why they were so positive about the, the wait. then they got back with five weeks to go 
uh, from reading between the lines Tony Considine ran the shite out of them for four weeks and they were absolutely flying ready to go Lee so what do we know yeah exactly what do we know I mean it's often a sunny holiday sure um, I mean they managed it very well haven't they like I mean he sort of basically it felt like a season ending kind of holiday and then they went through a little mini pre-season again it was like hitting reset yeah, you know what it's like with Christmas and all too. Like you go, you drink too much, you eat too much, then you feel it's obviously you're not going to put on weight in two weeks, really. Like, but you feel a bit crap about yourself, and then you're sort of like, you know what? I actually wouldn't mind going back again. You know, it's good for yeah. the mind to like to want to go back and sort of cleanse yourself again, nearly. Yeah. Uh, so it's good to just overindulge, and then it gives you that sort of hunger again to actually go out and go for it again, which is obviously what they did, and it worked a treat. That's a very good point. The only way to sell this back to we're back to preseason lads is to actually make them want to get back to preseason. The whole January after Christmas kind of lets everyone join the gym and feel, you know, kind of some bit fit and healthy again. Maybe that's kind of it. So Michal Houlihan uh, was interviewed after the match and I thought he spoke very well and he got distracted halfway through the match because Noreen Burke was trying to uh, say something to him. And he says, I can't, uh, Noreen Burke's trying to talk to me here. And Noreen Burke lands on the camera then. And she's a, she looks like a larger than life type character. She's the hair dyed, and she, I think she had some hulahan a cone or something she had. And a fella, like I mean, a fella replied to me on Twitter. He says, "There's a Noreen Burke in every club in the country." <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think who's the Noreen Burke in my club now. <laughs> <laughs> I won't name any names, but she was like she had the, she had that ice cream cone that you see outside the shop selling. Yeah, with hulahan like. written on it. And the green and white, covered in green and white for Kilmalik, and she was wearing the Kilmalik flag as a scarf. So she had the she had the whole thing there, and it's just sure. I suppose the beauty of the club championship, everyone in the community involved, and the players kind of. Do you know, having the crack with their, yeah. their own sport is great to see. I was disappointed that he, she wasn't asked a question. The interview yeah, is actually yeah. cut a little bit short. I would like to hear her, hear from Noreen Burke. She seemed like a right character. Uh, it's interesting that that final um, Kilmalik. Uh, versus Bally Gunner. That's on the January the eighth or the ninth. But in the week leading up to that match, um, Graham Mulcahy's getting married on January the second, and Paddy O'Brien's getting married the week after. So, like, I mean, talk about a bit of a disaster. Like, I'd say Kilmallock and Bally Gunner would love that game on next weekend. Just get it done, enjoy the Christmas, and be out the door. I don't know why that's been dragged over, um, over the Christmas while the Leinster one. Well, the Leinster one isn't. Other big one before we get into the football all-stars here is Nace beat Glen Moore. This is a massive result for Nace. Like, I mean, we talk about the dominance of the Kilkenny clubs because they've only 12 <coughs> senior clubs now. So Glen Moore are the 13th best team in Kilkenny. Like, they're not the 17th, like in most other counties. They're the 13th best team. Like, they're a senior team in the majority of counties in Ireland and they're not the worst senior team. They're not getting relegated. They're the 13th best. So it's a massive win for Nace. And Glenmore were after giving Freshford a hiding in the Kilkenny final, bet them 15 points. Like So, like, obviously going in with a lot of confidence into this game, Kilkenny clubs haven't won the last eight Leinster championships in a row. Like, and like we've seen when Tullerone won the All-Ireland, like, we've seen how much that, like, those, you were talking about it earlier, those provincial club championships, like, they're just, there's a bit of magic about them, like. Yeah. And I'd say Glen I can't Moore, talk these up more. No, not at all. Like, and you, I've seen it with Turin as well, when they won the Connacht one. Like there was ma- great scenes, like uh, celebrations, and then more. I'd say they would have been eager, you know, to follow in Tullerone's footsteps. Like having seen the kind of the joy that they got out of winning that intermediate um, All Ireland. Like, but I suppose when when you see like they they were they were well beaten yesterday. Like like Nace. Nace scored. I think it was one ten. Nace got one ten from play. And Glenmore got three points. Like and. You said there, Tom Mullally, he was the Nace, the Nace manager. He's a Glenmore man and his two brothers hurled for Glenmore and, and for Kilkenny, Paddy and Richie Mullally. Like, so like it was, it's mad that he was the man that kind of brought them, brought them down in this competition. But I suppose it's a sign that Kildare hurling is really on the rise like, because their under-20s beat Wexford this year in the Leinster Championship. Yeah. Apparently Nace, they've been, they've been winning underage titles the whole way up along and... Apparently, it's been a bit of a run and joke that they just couldn't win the senior. They lost in, in a few. It was our clock beat them in a, a pure underdogs beat them in the Kildare final. I think it was two years ago. And I suppose they're just they're a young team and definitely a common team. Like a lot of the lads, there's a James Burke playing. He's actually there's two dual players on the team as well who are with the footballers. And he's a lad that's hurled Fitzgibbon Cup. Like there's a Rian Bohr and Simon Lacey. Like these lads are hurling Fitzgibbon Cup with DCU UCC. Like they're very good hurlers and. Like that's why Nace are 
like they're they're obviously a, great, a, a very good team if they're making light of Kil- Kilkenny's 13th best club. Like. Yeah, definitely. Is that, are they in a Leinster final out or footballers are in a semi-final and they would be very strong favourites to beat uh, Shell Mal- Maliers from, from Wexford. So they'll be in a Leinster final, you'd imagine. The are in the final, yeah. As well. This that is a final. Semi-final, she's yeah. a Leinster double. Fantastic <laughs> achievement. Yeah, geez, no, it's it's um, it's um great stuff from Nace. And I suppose it, it was, you'd, you'd call it underachievement from a town as big as Nace. Like I was reading somewhere today that they have something like 80 teams in the club like and the fact that they hadn't been winning too many county titles before this year definitely was an underachievement but they're they're going the right way now. Yeah, don't worry Lee, I'm not going to ask you about the NACE Intermediate or the NACE, well it's their senior team isn't it? It's Senior, uh, yeah. yeah. They're in the, yeah. playing into the Intermediate uh, Leinster Championship. We'll move on to the All-Stars here. Like I mean, we talked about this last Thursday, um, Lee. Uh, they kind of winded me up putting Myler and McGeary in the half back line because that was something that I was I was trying not to do. I'll, I'll accept their I'll accept them given Sludden. I think Sludden's an excellent player. I think he probably did deserve a, a, an All Star. No problem with that. Kennedy and getting one ahead of Kilpatrick is probably the, the standout talking point uh, for me. Yeah, it is. Um, Con Kilpatrick definitely. Uh, the feeling would definitely have been that he, he was a sure like a shoe in to get an All Star. Um, Brian Kennedy had a brilliant season. Don't get me wrong. He he had like. He really had to prove himself to get into the team. He was a sub against Cavan in the first round of Ulster, but he came on, won a few kickouts and um, scored a, a really tidy goal. And then, you know, he never looked back from there. He was a mainstay in the team pretty much. But uh, Con Kilpatrick was definitely the more A-catching of the two. He got a real partnership with Niall Morgan in terms of winning the kickouts. was a fantastic outlet there. Had his real highlight real moment in the final, you know, winning that last kickout to... And then laying it off to was a Connor McKenna, which set up the Mercury yeah. goal. You know, it, it all just teed up rightly for uh, Con Kilpatrick to get that spot. But um, you wouldn't begrudge, obviously, Brian um, getting an All Star. But if, if when it was a direct comparison with his uh, partner in crime, like it, you have to say that, it, that Con Kilpatrick probably deserved it. Yeah, because Kilpatrick's more dynamic. Like I mean, he's you know equally good in the air. And to be honest, like I remember being up in Eden Dark before the All Ireland final, and I remember even talking about it on the show here and like. The analysis on this show, whether it was right or wrong, it was proved to be wrong in the end because Kennedy not only played but had a very good final, was will Kennedy start the final? Do you know what I mean? That was kind of the, the, the thought. And if, like, are you talking about an all, a potential all-star potentially not making the final? You know, and again, yeah. I have no problem saying that I was wrong because I might have dropped him if you were sitting down. But then again, you know, he had a, he had a brilliant final and he, I think he proved an awful lot of people wrong in the final but I'm still not sure it was enough to get an all-star ahead of Con Kilpatrick. Yeah, no, it definitely wasn't. That, that's the thing. I mean, and it, it sort of shows you where, where he was in people's psyche at that time. Uh, it's, like, he wasn't one of the mainstay of, of Tyrone. Uh, all the way through the league, Brian Duhar and Fergal, they were experimenting a lot with um, uh, the Donnelly brothers, Richie Donnelly and Matty Donnelly. They were playing midfield a fair few times, thinking that was maybe the dynamic that they were going to go for. So there was obviously something about Brian that, you know, they maybe it took a wee while before they gained that trust, but they did, and, and he repaid them totally. Yeah. But uh, no, he just wasn't as obvious a choice as, as Colin Kilpatrick, and you have to feel for Colin for missing out. Yeah, no real other uh, huge talking points. Thomas Sullivan, we we completely forgot about here <coughs> um, yeah. last week, Niall. And um, like, I mean, when you think about it, he cleaned McCurry out in that all in semi-final until maybe extra time when McCurry uh, came into it and Kerry were cramping and, uh, you know, all sorts of kind of, you know, they they had, uh, they had used all their subs at that stage. I remember Jason Foley was cramping up uh, whenever uh, Cottle McShane was cleaning him and they couldn't bring they couldn't bring him off. But anyways, you'd have to say McCurry got a late point or two, but Thomas Sullivan destroyed him in normal time. And, you know, sometimes, again, Dublin get all stars because they cruise through Leinster. But I suppose we don't we don't recognise a Munster title, um, you know, in the, you know, in the same way as we do a Connacht or an Ulster. Yeah. And in fairness to Tom O'Sullivan, like he is, he's such a consistent player for Kerry, like the last two or three years. And it was the same again this year. Like, and while maybe you don't give as much credit to him for for games, they're kind of cruising through in Munster. Like that one against Tyrone was the big game, and he got the better of Darren McCurry, who's an all-star himself. Like, and he's just—he's a real sort of tigerish player, but he's a clever player as well, Thomas Sullivan. So, like, he was—I suppose he—he he probably was looking back on it. He—he he did deserve his place there. Yeah, I think so. So, any issues with it for you, Lee? Uh, a little bit. I mean, Paddy Durkin missing out probably um, when putting Connor Mailer into the halfback lane. I would have moved Darren McCurry into corner forward, taking out Kieran Kilkenny completely. 
Connor Mailer in the half forward and Paddy Durkin in the half back. Right. It's probably the the one change I would have went with, but yeah. Nothing, nothing too major, obviously. Yeah, nothing, but nothing that, went for that. Yeah, nothing that anybody's going, this is a joke of a team. It seems to be a team that's yeah. generally accepted uh, by everybody that I saw. You know, Ryan O'Donoghue, we were talking him or Tommy Conroy the last day. And I think we came down in Ryan O'Donoghue, uh, Ryan O'Donoghue's side um, if, from memory. I had Kilkenny on it as well, but I can't remember. I, did, I, did, I don't think I had Sludden on it. But again, you wouldn't have any problem. You wouldn't have any problem with any of them, to be honest with you. So, like, I mean, that's that's a first. Unusual um, for us, isn't for, it? Un- unusual for me, especially. <laughs> Usually I'm straight onto Twitter going, this is a farce. Um, Kira McGeary had a few interesting comments after the after the match, and or not after the award. So, like, I mean, he was talking about um, after the Kerry match. So after the Kerry match, Tyrone uh, went big into one-on-one defending and training. Because they obviously, that day they weren't very good at it. And uh, he said after that, he's talking about the Kerry match, the exposure we had to 1v1s in training was re- re- incredible. It was one of those one-on-ones. You keep being uncomfortable in a situation until you're comfortable with it. That day, every single, en- every single one of us got beat. Um, and then he, he went on to describe the one-on-one training. He said at the start, it was scary. You could have Conor McKenna, an Aussie Rules professional, coming like a gazelle at you. Sidestep, your feet are in a twist and he's gone past you. But if you do that time and time again, you start to learn where you need to get your feet placed or where you need your body position to be in. I, I, I was reading that going, holy shit, how bad had it gotten in Tyrone that they had completely forgot any element of one-on-one defending or what you need to do in one-on-one? Isn't that mad to think that this was scary for Kier McGeary to actually have to man mark someone? mark someone and actually be responsible for them. Isn't it bloody mad the way he's talking about how scary it was? Like, I mean, how far had they gone down the rabbit hole of of zonal defending where you have your buddy helping you? Yeah, no, that's it. And, and being totally reliant on that maybe sweeper in behind you and you could just go for every first ball and stuff without too much fear of getting turned or twisted. But uh, it's sort of credit to Fergal and Brian in that situation because you could have very easily after that, that loss in Killarney to be like, Right now we're going, you know, defensive again. We tried that; it didn't work. We'll put every man behind the ball and play like how you know Trone would have traditionally played. But instead of doing that, you know, they had like they had the, the same conviction and belief in the way they wanted to play football to not change it. But they had they were also realistic about it and be like, right, we're not very good. So they addressed the problem head on and like Kieran said, put them in uncomfortable positions, you know, and they just drilled it and drilled it until they uh, eventually started to get it right. So I thought it was a really good uh, management. It's, it's positive as well, you know, that it sort of forced that change, but now they are uh, more of an attacking team and we're sort of drifting away from that defensive mindset. Yeah, and to have their full back line who are very, very good markers and who are well able to hold their man up and maybe not kind of let him run, run past him. And then he just continued on, he says, you're a wing forward or you're a wing back. That's how you're marking. Go out and do your job. And that kind of, when I read that, that's kind of like the message they were given. It's almost like the Roy Keane school of punditry. Go out and do your job. Don't be coming complaining to me. Mark your man. Don't let him score. That's what you're supposed to be doing. Do you know? But like, I mean, I think there can be too much of a softy, softy element with this. You know, get over and help your man and double up on him and do it. Mark you. How about you mark your man? Don't be coming to me with excuses. Mark him. And if you're not able to mark him, I'll bring someone else in that can mark him. Now, that's the real old school kind of, kind of lecture you could be getting. Also. I think we, there's no harm going back into that a little bit. Because, like, I mean, I, I know f- from talking to different lads, you'll be managing teams and, oh, well, <coughs> he should be dropping back to help me mm. and he should be... Do- Shut up. Mark your man or I'll take you off. Well, it's fairly, it's fairly um, obvious what you have to do when, when you're told to mark your man and you mind him and he's your business. And if he's scoring, like you're the one that's going to be brought off, like so. Yeah. You're not like relying on someone that's there beside you to, you know, clean up your mess, maybe, and to you're not kind of you're not able to. You've no place to hide, really. And I suppose that bit of old school, that kind of Roy Keane, as you call it, like maybe it's it's no harm, and it definitely did uh, Tyrone no harm when they got to the All Ireland final. I I remember uh, before we finish up, it was back in 1999. I got dropped from leash. Um, it was only my second year. I had a fantastic uh, debut year and I was playing wing back. And uh, sure, my, my way of playing wing back was always like, go forward, have your man, have my man mark me and he'd be more worried about me than the other way around. Because I wouldn't have been a great defender as such. I often would have dropped off my man and maybe helped out from behind me. But anyway, we had one, we had a, a cornerback in behind me who would have been pushing on in years. 
And obviously he was getting a scutching or two and he started whinging to the management. Jeez, well, he's going too far now. He's leaving too much space in front of me. You know, like, poor old me. Like, I mean, in my, in my situation, I would have marked my man out from the front there, you know, because there's too much of a gap then. Like, I mean, there's a way around this. But he, he got into the, the management's head so much because he was more experienced. And he had the management tell me that I wasn't allowed to cross the halfway line. Now I'm in big trouble because I'm not the best mar- marker in the world. So my whole way of marking or my whole way of playing the game and enjoying the game was completely gone because this whinger in behind me couldn't mark his, couldn't deal with his own shit, pretty much. And I ended up getting dropped because I wouldn't follow the instruction of not crossing the halfway line. It was a total mess. So, like, I mean, I do accept, stop whinging, mark your man. <laughs> maybe all, I, maybe I've got a lot of demons in my, in my, <laughs> in my past that's all coming out now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get it all off your chest there. <laughs> mark <Sure>. your man. <laughs> No, but like it is, it's the most frustrating thing when you hear a defender and he's like, lads, did you give me a bit of protection? Like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's maybe a, a cornerback or a fullback and he's like, lads, you need to get back. Like, do I'm, did my man has too much space here? Like, you're there and that's your job yeah. to mark him. Like. That's, your, that's meant to be your specialty on this team. Mark him. Yeah. Now, I, I'm not saying that players shouldn't drop off and help each other out. Of course they should. But you shouldn't be whinging if you're not able to mark your man. That's the way... Unless that's it's the, Desi Hutchinson inside or something well, like yeah, that. Yeah, like you'd have a bit of sympathy on whoever's marking Desi. Yeah, definitely. We could dro- you could let someone drop off and co- cover the space in front of him uh, for sure. Anyways, we'll leave it there. We'll be back on Thursday and we'll preview all the weekend's uh, club action. So we'll talk to you all then. Good luck. Good luck.